This lecture is going to deal with the balance sheet, and for the most part, it's going to kind of stress how a classified balance sheet should be structured. You guys should already have an idea of what a balance sheet does and what its purpose is and all that other good stuff, some of the disadvantages that uh, the reporting side of a balance sheet may display, and you can read that successfully in the text. I'm just here right now to kind of guide you guys in terms of how you're supposed to structure a proper balance sheet. And so for the most part, we're going to it's all about classifications and characterizing correctly. And so you have to be able to classify the type of account and be able to characterize it in its right place. And so that's pretty much what we're going to talk about. Now, you know, your balance sheet is broken down into three particular sections. You have your assets, your liabilities, and you have stockholders' equity. And so what we're going to do is we're going to break them down accordingly, starting with our assets first. Now, you should already be aware of that your balance sheet always lists assets in order of its liquidity. And so um, when we talk about liquidity, we talk about how easily something could be converted into cash. And so obviously we know from financial that um, cash is always first. Okay. And so now what we're about to do is I'm just going to go step for step for each particular account. How is it classified? What's the conditions of it being classified that way? And where do we categorize it at? Okay? And so we're going to start off with our assets again. And the first part of our assets are going to be our short-term assets. All right? And in terms of short-term assets, by definition, we say that's any assets that you convert into cash less than a year or operating cycle, whichever is longer. Now, we we'll elaborate a little bit on the operating cycle part. Some companies have an operating cycle that extends beyond a 12-month period. Um, and it's just a matter of a fact. And so you may have some companies that operating cycle because of the product or the industry or whatever they do to generate their revenues may have to extend beyond a natural 12-month calendar year. Okay, it may be 14 months. It may be 18 months. I'm sorry. Yeah, 14 months. It may be 18 months. It could be 20-something months. Who knows, right? But once the operating cycle exceeds a 12-month period, that's what's going to justify the rule of it being considered current or not. So for example, if we had a company with a 16-month operating cycle, obviously anything that converted to cash less than 16 months will be considered current. And so moving forward, the very first asset that you're going to always talk about is going to be your cash, right? Cash is king. We know what cash consists of. We know what cash... Uh, means we talk about in a dollar value sense uh, we have cash we have cash on hand currency uh, foreign currency um, coins things of that nature all that's considered cash it can be deposited into an account but it has to be considered cash okay and so that's going to come first the next account right after cash is going to be considered cash equivalent and the formal, the informal definition that I like to share with you guys is it's a, it's, it's a, it's a type of investment. A cash equivalent would be considered an investment that's going to convert into cash less than three months. Any type of investment that's going to convert into cash less than three months. So this is highly liquid, right? We're talking three months from the reporting period. The reporting period being the balance sheet date. So if the balance sheet date is December 31st, Three months after that dictates whether or not it's going to be a cash equivalent if it converts into cash within there. And you have several examples. You may have some, uh, you may have, uh, how about a CD? You invest in a CD, and a CD is going to mature within two months. Well, if the CD matures within two months, that meets the criteria of it being a cash equivalent. You could have a particular, um, you could have a particular money market investment that is going to expect to convert into cash within two months. So the rule of thumb here is always paying attention to how long it's going to mature. And that's going to dictate whether or not it's a cash equivalent. Another example of a cash equivalent could simply be um, treasury bills. We talk a lot about treasury bills. Treasury bills are those um, type of investments in which uh, issued by the government. They just basically borrow money from you guys. And most of those treasury bills, they convert into cash in a matter of days or weeks. So anytime you see the word treasury bill, nine times out of ten, that's going to be a cash equivalent 
if it's less than three months. So all those would be considered cash equivalents. The next thing that we would talk about right after cash equivalents would be your short-term investments. Short-term investments are also known as marketable securities, okay? So you may hear the word marketable securities, you may hear the word short-term investments, it's the same exact thing. And these are highly securities that's marketable, right? These securities are still gonna be those ones that you're gonna convert into cash less than a year, right? But longer than three months. Because remember, if it's in between that three month time frame, it's a cash equivalent. So the minute it jumps out of that three month time frame and it still converts into cash less than a year operating cycle, it becomes a short term uh, investment. So again, that could be a CD, right? But instead of it being a three month or a two month CD, it may be a six month CD. If that's a six month CD, then obviously that could be considered a short term investment. You have some of those. Um, Securities that you purchase of another company that you expect to kind of, you speculate that you're going to flip it to get a gain or whatnot, and you may not hold it longer than a year, but then that particular investment um, would be considered a marketable security. Remember, guys, we can invest in bonds too, right? We can lend other companies money, and we can expect to get that back with plus interest. So, you know, bonds are normally long term, but I'm just using that as an example of that a bond could be an investment if you invest, if you lend the money out. Okay? So, after short term investments comes uh, receivables. All right? And so, we know what account receivables are those receivables that are created whenever a service is provided, particularly account receivable, or you sell a product. And no cash is involved, right? So that's the accrual part of generating revenue. And basically, we know that those receivables come right after short-term investments, okay? So not only will we have account receivables, but we can also have note receivables. We could also have various interest receivables, okay? And so any type of receivable with a last name should go in this area if, if it's expected to convert into cash less than a year on operating cycle. So as long as you convert that or collecting on that receivable less than a year on operating cycle, it will fall here. And we're still talking about current assets and we talk about the actual fourth place of current assets, those receivables. Now, no receivables are automatically considered to be long-term, but if you have a receivable that's gonna mature or collect within a year, it goes right here as a current asset. Now, what about receivables that extend beyond a year? Let's assume we have an accounts receivable that is specifically stated that this receivable we're not going to collect until the following year, okay, longer than operating cycle. Well, we can't put it as a current um, receivable or current asset. That particular receivable, so the rule of thumb is any receivable that you hold longer than a year cannot be current. It has to be long term under the category called investments. And I'll reiterate that a little bit later as time proceeds, okay? So that's pretty much your receivables uh, section. Normally, interest receivable is always a current part. So all your receivables will go there. Do not forget your contract account to accounts receivable. We have a couple of them. Obviously, allowance for, uh, allowance for uncollectible account is one, and we have another allowance that I'm gonna talk about later in the course. But for right now, just do not forget your allowance for uncollectible accounts that needs to be deducted from accounts receivable, okay? So right after accounts receivable comes our inventories. We're still in current. Inventories are basically any type of product you purchase and you're trying to sell or generate a revenue. We know what inventories are. And we know that merchandising companies have one inventory. Manufacturing companies, which you may learn from managerial, has three. Okay, so all those inventories go in this section. This is the order, guys, that we're going to process this information. So you have to memorize this and understand the rule of thumb that I'm, I'm sharing with you all at this time. Okay, and so last but not least, after you report your inventories, you finally have the prepaid. Okay, now we know what a prepaid is, right? Prepaids are assets, but there are assets that come in whenever we prepay on an expense. Okay. So the rule of thumb is, if you prepay for an expense no longer than 12 months, as long as it doesn't exceed a year or operating cycle, that whole portion of the prepaid asset should go right here. It should go right after inventories. So for example, if I prepay rent 
for 12 months moving forward it still meets the criteria of it being current. And so I'm going to move that prepaid as a current asset in this particular placement. Now, what would happen if your prepaids exceed beyond? Okay, here's the rule. If your prepaids exceed beyond the operating cycle or the 12 month period, you have to break it up. Okay, so the portion of the prepaid that is within the 12 month cycle still remains as a current asset. However, the portion that exceeds beyond the 12 month cycle, that portion must be separated and it must be reported as a title called other assets, which is a long term asset. Okay, so let me illustrate this for you guys. Suppose we have a 16 month prepaid rent. Sixteen month prepaid rent for sixteen thousand dollars. Okay. How will we report this? Well, this sixteen thousand dollars obviously from the Mets perspective is a thousand per month. So what's gonna happen is it's gonna be broken down and separated. Twelve thousand dollars will be allocated in one section, and the remaining four thousand will be allocated in another section. Now, because this is a prepaid, the rule of thumb tells us that this $12,000 that'll be mature within 12 months of operating cycle is a current asset. And particularly, it's going to be characterized as a prepaid, as itself. Prepaid. Okay? Very right. However, the $4,000... The $4,000, because it extends beyond the operating cycle, we're going to call that a long-term asset, right? Long-term or non-current asset. And it's going to be classified in a particular category called other assets. Okay? And pretty much it's just that. Everything that I've discussed so far will lead you up to your um, how to categorize and classify your current assets. Okay?